Well, welcome back, everybody. It's good to have the band back together, and welcome to session one of the fall season of House and Home. It's been a minute since we've gotten together, so it's really wonderful to have everybody back with us. Uh, great to see so many familiar names and faces in in the in the chat window there, in the go to meeting window. And we really appreciate you guys spending some time with us tonight. We are going to be diving into a session tonight called what's going on and what's going well uh there's a lot to cover tonight and we got a jam-packed session so we're going to get right after it for those of you i haven't had a chance to meet my name is scott fuso i'm the director of education for cso management and i'm the host of our house and home series uh, i'm a member of beta theta pi at, uh, from middle tennessee state where i had an absolutely life-changing fraternity experience and that's really the reason why i continue to do the work that i do today as of uh yesterday i'm officially uh, the father of a college-bound student, which is exciting. I began my IKEA assembly marathon yesterday, uh, so I'm just going to put it out there because this is a friendly group. If anybody's interested in helping me assemble a room full of IKEA furniture, please hit me up in the chat. We'd be more than welcome to take you to Muncie, Indiana with us over the weekend. So, uh, But I'm so grateful that uh, you guys are with us. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, you could have been anywhere in the world tonight, you chose to be here and what that reveals to us is you care deeply for our students for these structures and for this experience that we call fraternity and sorority so for that for giving your time talent and treasure uh and, and specifically your your uh, your heart to these to these students we need you to know we're grateful uh they are leaving their especially right this time of year they're leaving their families of origin looking for that family of choice and everybody on this call is doing their their part to help create that home away from home for these young men and women. So for that, we need you to know that we're extraordinarily grateful. Uh, I will be, in addition to serving as how, uh, the host of the call tonight, I'm going to be hosting uh, the, the chat feature as well. So we're going to have everybody in listen-only mode throughout the night. But if you have questions over something that we covered during tonight's session, would love for you to hop into the chat and fire away with your questions. And I'll inter uh, interrupt our speaker along the way with those questions, uh, just a little easier to manage the, uh, the background noise when we have everybody in listen-only mode. But if you can hop in there, pop your questions there, and I'll interrupt Don as we, as we move through the night. So uh, that's the easiest way to, to manage that chat, but we wanna make sure that you leave here with your, with your questions answered. So please don't hesitate to jump in the chat and share what you're thinking and what you're questioning. So, with that being said, here's what we want you to get out of tonight's what's going on and what's going well session. We would love for you to leave here with some clarity about what's coming. We're going to share a lot of information with you about what is coming up, especially through the year 2026. And it's going to be really impactful for you to know because it's going to be having a major impact on A, our membership and B, the occupancy of our houses. So it's really important for you to leave here with some clarity and some understanding, a very clear understanding of what is coming our way and how that's going to impact our membership and, again, our housing environments. We would also love for you to leave here tonight excited. We want you to leave here excited about uh, the gaps that our experience is filling. What you're going to hear tonight, uh, closer to the end of our time together, is the ways that fraternity and sorority are coming alongside students in ways that other organizations cannot. We are equipping, preparing, and serving students in pretty extraordinary ways, and I cannot wait for Don to share that with you tonight. I think you're gonna leave this call inspired uh, and educated, confident, and compelled to continue to build into these students and to continue to serve this experience that we call fraternity and sorority. So really excited to share uh, really quickly an introduction of tonight's guest speaker, we are thrilled to have Dr. Dawn Weiss with us tonight. She is just a strategist, a researcher, an advocate for fraternity and sorority. She is a sought after speaker on Title IX, alcohol, drug, uh, drug use, and higher education. She is a member, a proud member of Tri Delta. And she's also, she was received her, her master's from Virginia Tech and her PhD from uh, UNC Greensboro. She is uh, lucky for us. She is a former faculty member of the Sutherland Institute, which is our conference that we do. We started this year. We had the inaugural this year at uh, uh, for house directors in Denver, and we were so happy that, that Don came out and served with us there and spoke with our attendees there. Uh, but most importantly, she's a really devoted wife, and she's an extraordinary mom, and we are just thrilled to have her with us tonight. So 
If you wouldn't mind, please uh, give a big round of applause and welcome our, our, our good friend tonight, uh, Dr. Don Weiss. Don, take it away. Thank you so much, Scott. And I'm looking for that share button. It's coming. Perfect. Um, so thank you all for joining me. And, uh, you know, if there is something that I love, it's to talk about higher ed trends. Uh, but I love it more if you guys talk with me about it. And I recognize in this format, that's a little bit more difficult. But as I shared with Scott, please, please, please feel free to interrupt with questions. Uh, because it'll. my guess is if you have the question, others may have the question. And I don't I don't mind uh, getting off whatever screen I'm on to, uh, to, to, uh, to do that. I did see one question already come in from Charles Gill and and Charles I saw you're at East Tennessee so I'm not very far away from you Charles I live in the mountains of Virginia so we are in similar geography and it's good to see you um, his question had to do with whether or not I'll, I'll be talking about COVID protocols within housing I'm really going to be talking about big picture fraternity sorority and big picture higher ed that's kind of the world that I live in but Scott may have um, may have more information on that so Scott um, if you want to uh, maybe we can is maybe that's something that, do you do you have a quick answer on that scott or is that something uh, not a quick one let's cover that one at the end so uh, I, I don't want to okay. i want to really focus in on your content but we will definitely come back to some covid protocol content at the end uh Perfect. and i would if we let that sit there i know there's some folks that work for local house corporations and national house corporations that might have some insight insight into what they're recommending for their organizations too so i'd love to kind of lean into the expertise of our audience as well Okay, very good. Awesome. So Charles, we won't forget about that question. Um, as, as Scott shared, um, I, uh, I, um, I love uh, talking about higher ed trends, and I in particular love to talk about all that's working really, really well in fraternity and sorority. And so I'm going to spend, uh, that's, that's where I'm going to spend the majority of my time. Uh, Scott mentioned uh, that his daughter uh, going, off, uh, going off to college. I have a daughter who is a rising senior in college, uh, and I'm very interested in having her meet a boy other than her current boyfriend. And so we can talk about that too, if you ever wanna talk about that, because that's currently top of my list as she's nearing her, the end of her college. Uh, she is a rising senior at Kenyon College in Ohio. And she actually this fall will be studying in Stockholm at the Stockholm School of Economics. So that's uh, one way we're going to get her away from the current boyfriend for about four months this, this winter. So that's, uh, oh, uh, there's somebody from Indiana. That's not very far from Ohio. Um, so uh, that's, uh, that's where my mind is other than thinking about higher ed trends. So I'm gonna get started on this and things that we're gonna talk about. We're gonna talk about higher ed trends pre-COVID. And I'm gonna talk about that because they, because they certainly inform where we are now. And there have been some pretty significant shifts, what I would call it would be acceleration uh, to some things going on in higher ed uh, from pre-COVID to where we are at present. And I, I don't think I can call it post-COVID, um, but we're certainly at a different place in that we know we have students returning to campuses this fall. And so that's that's the, that's the environment at which I'm, if I say post-COVID, please know I don't mean to be insensitive. I'm, I'm really talking about where it is right now in terms of students returning to campus. Um, so uh, then we're gonna, we're gonna move into talking about the higher ed and higher ed cost pressures uh, and uh, what that means in terms of how fraternities and sororities fit into that big picture of what is college. Fraternities and sororities, I continue to believe, I, they've, they've played a critical role on campus and I think they're going to continue to play an even more critical role because of some things that go really, really well if we're leveraging those things that go really, really well, if we're leveraging those in a good way. Um, and, th and those are those implications. This screen is here because I want us to be thinking uh, about the forest and not the trees. So, you know, Scott shared that I, I do research, I do strategy. I spent 20 years on campuses before I switched over to working in, in the consulting area. And, and I was ultimately as a, uh, served as a vice president for student affairs. And when you work in this world, um, this world of, um, of all the great things going on with college students, but also, the cleanup of some things that are going on with college students. Sometimes, um, sometimes we can forget about that big picture because we're working on the cleanup, right? Um, we know that things don't always go well. That's why we're. That's part of the reason why we're why we all exist when we're working with college students. 
but the big picture is a very, very good big picture. And, and that's what I want to help us focus on. Uh, that's not to discount the things that, that um, are, are less rosy, uh, but to try to put those into a larger perspective. Um, and I'll tell you a quick story. I don't know if I told the story um, when I was with, uh, when I was with folks at the, um, at, the, uh, at the Housing Institute in June, um, but it's a story from years and years ago when I was a residence hall director. That was my very first professional job. And you'll have to tell me, Scott, if I told the story. So it was my very first professional job. And I was, I was trying so hard to know all of the residents in my building and to meet them all where they were and to do all those things, you know, to be sure I was the best residence hall director I could be. And there were two women, I, I remember they were in the they were in the wing of the building called First Floor East. I couldn't, I couldn't meet these two women. I tried my hardest to beyond saying hi, right? I just I felt like I didn't know them and I wanted to know them. Couldn't, couldn't make it happen. And I got back to my, my little apartment one night and there was a note on my door, uh, a little post-it note said, um, can you please come down to our room? We need you. And I'm like, oh my gosh, finally I'm needed, right? By these, by these two women who I'd been trying to reach. Did I tell the story, Scott? No, I didn't. I okay. So, okay. So I rushed down the hall and it's a little bit later. It's probably Oh, it's probably after 10 at this point. I rush down the hall because they need me, right? Um, and I knock on their door and and it's a pretty long pause until they answered. And then finally they open the door and it's dark. They were in bed. And I'm like, oh my gosh, I'm so sorry. It looks like I caught you after you were asleep, but you know, you left this note on my door. You said you needed me. You know, what can I do? What can I do to help? And uh, and they said, Oh, well, we needed a pair of scissors, but we got them, we're good. And that conversation really hit me because I, I think when we work in this field, sometimes we can be a bit fatalistic and assume that the foot, the shoe is about to drop at any moment when sometimes all people really need are a pair of scissors and they're having a great experience. Um, and so that's why I like to talk about the forest, the forest as opposed to the trees, because the forest, we're doing great great work um, and we're gonna that's how we'll end is by talking about all the great work first we're going to talk about what's going on in higher ed so uh, where we, where we were in January 2019 this uh, this map to the uh, on the right of your screen is really just there to uh, a, as a color graphic those colors don't mean anything we are in the midst of a significant drop-off in college enrollment, and you'll see, I, and I'm not going to read this screen to you, but you'll see on the left side of the left, left side of the screen, the Northeast and Midwest, serious, serious drops in enrollment. You may already be seeing that on your campuses. The West stable to dropping, with uh, with California uh, dropping a little less than the other areas. And again, this is January 2019. I'm going to talk a little differently about about uh, since COVID. Mountain states experiencing some growth. And when I talk about the mountain states, an example I like to use is Boise State. Um, you know, Cal kids who wanted who want that big school experience uh, from California, they're not getting into those University of California system schools and they funnel right on over to Boise uh, or uh, University of Nevada at Reno or University of Nevada, Las Vegas or the University of Arizona or Arizona State. When, so when we talk about those mountain, those mountain states, that's where we're seeing some of that growth. The Southeast and Texas are our serious growth states. Um, and, uh, and in January 2019, still looking at serious growth. Um, I kind of kid about Texas. My husband is a Texan, although he's lived in Virginia a lot longer. But he, uh, I think once a Texan, you always consider yourself a Texan. And so uh, uh, I break that out, Southeast and Texas, because he doesn't like when I, when I group it into the Southeast. And he definitely doesn't like when I say Texas is a Midwest state. Although if you look at the map, anyway, different story. Okay, so let me go next. So what's going on? We're going to talk about uh, dem the enrollment and migration uh, in terms of how that how that has an effect on demographics. And we've been hearing, you'll hear this in the news all the time, about how things are moving toward a Hispanic Southwest in terms of our U.S. population. The other thing that's going on in higher ed is that we have had uh, both high tuition and high financial aid, and those two things together 
have become problematic, right? The student loan crisis, schools putting themselves into a pretty bad situation of lending more money than they're bringing in, bank, kind of banking on the future. So this, this whole model, and we'll talk a little bit more about the finance aspect, is problematic within higher ed. The Northeast and the mid Midwest have been the traditional strongholds, and they're already anticipating a loss right now and into the mid 2020s by 5%. Now 5%, if it's 5% of what's in my wallet, not very much, but 5% of a student, student body, that's pretty significant, right? When you're dealing with your overall numbers. Um, the Great Recession uh, of 2007, because what we're talking about is birth rates over a, really a 20 year span, right? Because that's how you know who's coming to college is by looking at birth rates 20 years ago. The Great Recession, 2007, 2008, further dipped on those uh, on uh, on um, the future college students by a decrease of 12 percent. And so that's an automatic from 2007 into 20 years of what does that mean in terms of who's coming to college at that time. And that's why we talk about the year 2026 and why that is so important. The term being used within higher ed is the birth dearth, uh, reaching college campuses, dropping enrollment by at least an additional 15%. Now I want you to think about your college campus and what that means if there are 15% fewer students, that's a pretty significant drop. And that's an at least 15%. Okay, this is an older map, but I think I'm going to show you a new. I'm going to show you newer maps. But I want you to look at this uh, from 2017, and it shows even then that those drops in the Northeast and the Northern Midwest, and then where those where those growth states are. So I'll just let you look at that. And if anything really strikes you, feel free to put that into the chat. I'll. Uh, I'll uh, let you look at that for a few minutes, though. I'll, I'll, I'll share you something that when I first saw this map, I'm like, what is going on in South Carolina? And so I dug into South Carolina a little, a little deeper. And uh, what was happening were um, there were some favor favorable things in the economy uh, that, was, that was leading toward population growth. But also, if you know where Charlotte is, I wish I wish you could see my little my, my pen. My pen is pointing at my screen. Charlotte is right on that border, kind of where you see that triangle dip on the bottom of North Carolina. Um, and that's that's about where Charlotte is. And so as Charlotte continued to expand in North Carolina, the population center just south of there continued to really expand. Also pretty significant growth in Greenville, Spartanburg, uh, which is that upcountry. Anybody else see anything that's really striking your interest? I know people who are like in Illinois are like, oh, because that's a really painful one. Upstate New York, painful, painful. Um, Rhode Island, I think, I can, uh, it's behind a number on my screen. I know there's somebody on here from Rhode Island, uh, not experiencing the same amount of of, uh, of drop as some of its neighbor states, but still experiencing experiencing um, some drop. I know we've got some California, we've got at least one California person. You can see the beginning of that uh, of that drop in California, and then there are those mountain states that I talked about. So I'll move off this map. Okay, so now we're going to talk about fertility rates. Uh, fertility rates for Hispanic and non-Hispanic uh, Black women has exceeded the national average. However, non-Hispanic Black women births are now within the mean. Um, and so that's when we talk about that Hispanic and Hispanic Southwest, that's what we're talking about. Non-Hispanic white women are falling five to 10% below the current national average of births. Um, total fertility rate of Hispanic, 25% higher than, than that for non-Hispanic white women. So that's when we start, when we start seeing uh, fraternities and sororities thinking about the Hispanic student experience and what that means, that's what's informing these numbers or yeah. Okay, non-Hispanic white students from public schools, um, are in steady decline, and that has been the current largest source of college students. Uh, it is predicted that by, tw by 2026, there will be 265,000 fewer graduates from this subgroup. Um, and, it, and we'll talk a little bit more about, okay, uh, is it equal then as these non-Hispanic white students decline and, and Hispanic students increase, does that even out? We're gonna talk a little bit more about that. Okay. 
and this is where we talk about that. We're going to talk about what's called the Higher Education Index Demand, or HEDI. HEDI informs uh, how colleges predict enrollment. And it's informed, oh, educational longitudinal study, uh, college going based on demographic variables, right? So when, if you ever hear about behavioral economics, that's what this is coming out of. Uh, so it's looking at demand dependent upon type of institutional location, looking at these factors that you're now seeing, sex, race, that's, race, ethnicities, parental education, geographic location, all of those things feed into this formula that's used to try to predict college enrollment. And then even within a state or region, children of different backgrounds do not enter the demand equation equally. So when I, when I talked about uh, if we have a decline in, in uh, white, non-Hispanic, and an increase in Hispanic, does that even out? And if you're using HETI, the answer is no, and we'll look at what, what that means. Because um, what, what people who are predicting enrollment, it's not about college-aged students, it's about college-bound students. Who's actually going? We're also going to talk a little bit about institutional type as we look at that. Family income, race and ethnicity, and parental education are the greatest predictors for college attendance. This has been true for years and years and years. Um, and now as we're seeing some real shift in our US demographics, this is coming in more into play. So uh, geographic, birth rate, race, ethnicity suggests that there will be fewer college students in the future. However, we have a significant rise in parental education. So while that has been a predictor, we have more college graduates in the nation than we ever have before. So one might think that means, well, that should help us, right, in terms of college enrollment. However, those positive effects of parental ed education are overwhelmed by that birth dearth, that decline in births, immigration, and migration. And we'll talk about that. This, while not a beautiful graphic, is probably the most important graphic I'm going to put up on this screen tonight. The top has college age students, and the bottom has college going students. And you can see, look at that year 2025, is really where it starts to drop off. So we know the college aged right? That alone is plummeting. But then you look at college going, and it is serious and significant. I'm going to leave that here for just a second so you can look at it. And, and if you have any comments, please feel free to enter those. Actually, I'm going to take a quick sip of water. Yeah, Don, while you're taking your drink, this is uh, when, when we talk about the outcomes and what we want you to get out of this session tonight, guys, it's that's that's the screen, right? Uh, if we are not preparing for that uh, and really giving some thoughtful consideration to how that's going to impact our membership trends uh, and how that's going, how our membership trends are going to impact our occupancy rates that are in our facilities, we are being short-sighted. It's not a matter of if, but a matter of when. Correct, Don? Absolutely. And if and if if, this, if you love this kind of stuff, I drew uh, this graphic is coming right out of a book called it's, it's called something like Demographics and Demand in Higher Education. Uh, but it's by a man named Nathan Graw, G-R-A-W-E. And he's an economist out of Carleton College. Interesting story about why he wrote his book, Carleton College, Minnesota, so northern Midwest. Uh, and his provost, he's an economics professor there, his provost said, hey, we need to have a better understanding of, um, of how this demographic uh, decline is going to affect us as an institution. And that's when he started doing his research. Um, and so that's, uh, if you're really interested in this, that would be, that would be the thing to, thing to look at. So where were we in 2019? We're gonna talk about the flagship and elite campuses. I'm gonna talk about the almost flagships uh, and I'm talking about regional schools and community colleges. And I'm going to give you some context. Um, I'm going to use my state since I'm in Virginia. So when we talk about flagships, we're talking about the University of Virginia, um, to some degree, William and Mary. Uh, but that, and then we get really University of Virginia being our major flagship. Our almost flagships, Virginia Tech, William and Mary, 
George Mason University, and then our regionals are going to be schools like Radford University, um, Virginia Commonwealth University, Old Dominion University. So if that if that kind of helps to get an idea when I talk about flagships, almost and regionals, and then of course community colleges and Indiana having probably one of the top community college systems at, with its Ivy Tech system. So now let's talk a little bit about uh, migration. Um, I'm not expecting you to read this and I'm not going to read this, but I, I found um, this article, uh, it has still has not been published uh, because they're, uh, they're waiting for it to come out in publication, but they, uh, these two researchers out of Georgia Tech and Vanderbilt uh, did a study on migration during COVID by looking at, you can see 300,000 residential interstate moving, uh, moving companies. Um, and what did they find? that migration patterns and migrant motivations for moving have changed during the pandemic, uh, looking at th over 300,000 moves, and that the shift in migration during the pandemic has been to smaller cities, lower costs of living, locations with fewer pandemic-related restrictions, higher income households moving out of more populous cities, and moving more for lifestyle reasons and much less for work-related reasons. And I'll give you an example that I saw. So my sister, my, my younger sister lives uh, in a beach community in Florida and, uh, and she continued to see these houses that had been for sale and for rent for years suddenly had out of state plates and then all the for sale signs went away and what's been really interesting is a lot of those folks are staying there's uh there, she has one neighbor who uh, i um and i i was down there visiting her i guess it was in the spring and there was a tesla with washington dc plates um that was uh in a driveway and uh and uh she she told me i i noted it and she, and she was keeping track of what was selling and she said uh it moved from rental to sold and uh, and it looks like this fella thinks he's staying so I thought well that's a pretty good example of how those moves are happening that if people were predicting their ability to continue um, continue virtual work they just went ahead and made those moves now this is the least attractive map uh, maps that I'm going to show you but an important map or important maps. My daughter made fun of me. She was uh, she was home when I when I colored these maps all by myself. Um, but you'll see changes uh, in departures from states following COVID and where they arrived. And so I'm going to let you look at this because again you can see um, you can see those states uh, where we we're already talking about growth uh, in the southeast uh, and Texas. You're seeing that same thing in terms of uh, in ter look at, I mean, let's just look at Texas. Uh, no departures, lots of arrivals. Um, again, let's look at let's look at South Carolina. Um, a few departures. Oh, yeah, I'm going to talk about private colleges because that's my favorite subject. So don't you worry, Mary. We're going to get there. Um, I, I'm that's where I spent all of my career in private colleges. So it's a particular interest for me. Um, so thank you for saying that. Uh, but South Carolina, uh, in the end, ended up being a, a, a big beneficiary, and it was already a beneficiary, right? Um, and then if you look at California, I talked about how California pre-pandemic uh, was uh, already already losing uh, losing uh, losing people even more so uh, with the pandemic. So it kind of gives you an idea um, of where things are and um, and you're welcome to put up a compliment on my coloring. I was fairly fairly proud of my coloring in the lines. Okay, I'm gonna move off of that. So growth areas, Southeast, interestingly, other than Georgia, that was the one where there was, uh, where, where they were still experiencing uh, some decline, uh, different from the rest of the Southeast, Texas, Utah, Idaho, Montana. I'm guessing, don't know this, uh, but I'm guessing that's a, that's a California migration pattern. And so why is this important? Because it helps us better understand strengths within regions. Okay. Will colleges and universities stay as an online experience? The the uh, the uh, the ever the ever present question. Yes, no, and really what we're talking about moving forward is we're going to see a hybrid experience. Um, every indication is that college has changed, absolutely 100%. Uh, what we're hearing from students is that most students want in-person instruction, and they now have are coming to expect that lectures will still be available online with 79% of students saying that they want this. Now, students can say they want something, right? But that doesn't mean colleges and universities have to listen. 
unless, and as we're now seeing, uh, there's a demand equation and colleges are going to be competing in a different way for students because there are going to be fewer of them. So when you hear that 79% of students want lectures to be available online, you can bet we're still going to be seeing that. Um, so hence, I've got AI, artificial intelligence, intelligence, uh, every prediction is that it's going to be individualized to the learning experience now moving forward. Mm. So here's an example. Um, this, uh, let's see, do they want in-person instruction or just leave? Ah, great, great question, Debbie Friedman. Much appreciated. And I can tell you for, for my daughter, she was wanting to leave mom, mom and dad's house. Um, I love the question. Um, so St Stephen F. Austin. Uh, I think this is a great example because this is a Texas school. It'd be considered a Texas regional. Um, Texas, a strong school, right? I mean, a strong state for uh, for students. And already responding to uh, having an online online options. If you're attending Stephen F. Austin, uh, which is uh, in Eastern Texas, there are now both eight and 16 week calendars, online and in-person instruction. And this is coming, this quote is coming directly from, from your website, from their website. The, the idea that education is becoming more accessible, please, please, please come to our regional our regional institution, as opposed to going uh, out, a lot of Texans flooding out to University of Arkansas, uh, Oklahoma, Oklahoma State, et cetera. So that's a that's an example of how schools are already changing. And then many of you have likely heard about what's going on at University of Arizona. They've been doing it for a number of years that you can get online degrees, at least 12 degrees, five, six, 16 week type classes. Uh, so a lot of options at something like Air University of Arizona, Arizona State also, but I want just to give a couple of examples. Where were we also in 2019? Out of control costs uh, and questions regarding the value of degree. I just saw something yesterday that only 27% of jobs right now require a college degree, um, which is a really interesting thing, right? And 41% of current graduates are in jobs that require a degree. So these are students who already have the degree, but they're not in those jobs, uh, not in the jobs that require. So that's a, that when you have out of control costs, and that question of is the degree even worth it, that's when we really start seeing more pull on higher education. Great graphic, again, it gives you an idea. When I say tuition has gone up, there you go, using the, the, the consumer price index to give an idea. And that was till 2013. We didn't see dips in, uh, in tuition between 2013 and 2020. So what we're seeing, we, we can anticipate continued cuts in public higher education. And private higher education, I think, Mary, you asked about this question, is divided between haves and have-nots. And when I say haves and have-nots, I'm talking about the, the very few privates that um, have these massive, massive endowments um, and, uh, and uh, you know, much greater endowments than certainly the number of students that need to be served, right? Um, and we saw a tax bill related to that uh, during the Trump administration uh, in which uh, private higher ed uh, was getting taxed on those, uh, actually it was all higher ed, if you had those massive endowments that so outpaced the number of students you had, uh, then there, were, there was taxation. So private higher education divided between those haves and those have-nots, the ones that are so entirely tuition dependent. Uh, and then tuition discounting to attract students. I talked a little bit about that earlier, that we were that colleges and universities that have colleges and universities have been attempting to offer high loan, high aid packages to attract students. Um, and that's called tuition discounting to make the, the overall tuition uh, cost look lower. But with fewer students, you're not, they're not gonna be able to do that anymore. 27, this is a recent survey of, uh, uh, of college and university business officers, 27% uh, of these CFOs express strong confidence in the viability of their financial model over five years and looking out over 10 years, that drops to 13%. I love when I, when I see this figure, I like to think about this in the corporate sector, that if you had um, Cindy Stellhorn's on here, she works in the corporate sector. Um, if if her CFO or Scott, you're technically in the corporate sector. Um, if uh, if Woody Ratterman heard that uh, there was only 13% confidence in the business model over 10 years, he'd be freaking out. Um, and yet, 
uh, that, that's uh, only 13% have confidence in the higher ed financial model when looking out over 10 years. Uh, and this, this sentence has a lot of double negatives, but it's coming right out of this survey. Six in 10 CFOs disagree or strongly disagree with the statement that reports that a significant number of higher education institutions are facing existential financial crisis are overblown. In other words, 60% of CFOs believe that higher ed is facing existential financial crisis. That's where higher ed is in right now. And you think about that with that plummeting line of college students and the questioning of the value, you can really get a picture of how the financial model is right now for higher ed. Okay, a little bit more, and I won't spend too much more on this because I think we're, we're this can get dry fast. I think this is interesting. Um, so Moody's, Moody's has said the entire higher ed sector negative outlook. Uh, and then I talked about that net tuition revenue, the cash that colleges have left after financial aid flat or declining. For publics, state appropriations have not kept up. State spending is at its lowest since 1980. 10 years ago, students paid about a third of the cost of their education. Today, nearly half students pay for most of their education. Colorado is actually expected to be the first state where aid to higher ed is going to reach zero, followed uh, by 15 other states by 2050, including South Carolina, Massachusetts, and Virginia. Now, then I'm, I'm going to see if I can click onto this. I couldn't, I'm just going to see if this works. I didn't know if this would work or not. Hmm, looks like the map is not going to pull up. Okay, never mind. It's not going to pull up for me. Okay, well, now let me see if I can get back to my thing. If I move this, it must be bad if I, there we go. Okay. Um, if you are really interested in just jot down this uh, this uh, title in higher ed dive and there and, and what normally would pull up for me is an interactive map where you can click on a state and it tells you what colleges have closed in the state uh, really if you if you love going going through this kind of thing it's a pretty interesting map to play in now I've got to get back there we go so the price war uh, we're going to talk about corporate degrees, lower cost online programs, and changes within states. So Google is now treating tech certificates as equivalent to degrees, a direct challenge to uh, the, value of, the, the value of degree. 130 other companies are now recognizing Google certifications. And Google isn't the only one doing this, but this is pretty significant when you're thinking about uh, value of degree and over 250,000 people have, have taken one of these Google certificate programs. 57% of these in, individuals do not have college degrees, so we're already seeing a replacement of the traditional college with these certification programs. Employers invest in this as a benefit, so it's a, a direct way for, uh, for their employees to get additional education, and those attending are almost almost exclusively non-traditional students and it's uh, and they're uh, fully online offerings. Now let's look at North Carolina because I think this is a really interesting um, an interesting thing happening in the state of North Carolina and a way a state is responding to some of these pressures. And you'll see that I'm, I've highlighted uh, three different schools in University of North in, in North Carolina. These would all be considered regional institutions um, within the larger UNC system. If you are a state resident, you can now attend these state institutions for $500 per semester, not $500 per credit hour, not $500 per class, $500 per semester. Increasing access and bolstering the enrollment of these colleges, reducing student debt. So when, we, when we're here about the problems, this is an example of, of something that one state is doing. And now let's look at and I'll just let you look at this graphic. So I picked two other uh, what are considered regional institutions that did not uh, uh, implement the North Carolina Pro Promise Program, and then the, the enrollment of the three institutions that did for those same years. And you can see how that's making a difference. So 
we if, if other if other states start following this kind of a kind of a um, kind of a system to figure out okay what schools when we think about regionals what what can stay open and what doesn't and I thought that was really interesting and then when we think about community colleges in this in April we were hearing about um, about uh, funding community colleges at a higher at a higher rate looking at free community college i think tennessee may be one of the states where there's free community college uh, and so that's another way that we can see an impact on um, on attendance within a traditional four-year colleges and universities so where where is the strength and mary this is where i'm going to get to that question of let's talk about those privates whoops oops sorry went too fast where is our strength? Our strength are in the elites. Um, that's the, the top area where there's the most strength, that's where there's the most money. The elites are those privates and publics with the super large endowments. That's where the real strength is. Um, and so whether it's uh, whether it is the University of Southern California as a private uh, or uh, UCLA as a public Flag, we'll call it the public flagship. I guess you could argue uh, that maybe UC Berkeley, but that's where those uh, that's where the the real strength lies, um, and the flagships. Uh, so we're, we're looking at University of Texas Austin, Oklahoma, uh, Arkansas. Students are still going to gravitate toward those just as they have, and then all, and then those almost flagships. Um, this, the places where we're going to see the most uh, the uh, the the greatest hits are going to be the small private that are not considered elites and the regional colleges and universities. Uh, and if you're in those states with those declining population areas, those will be even harder hit. Um, I always hate to do examples uh, because that's where it starts to feel really personal. Um, but uh, let's see. Um, if we look at is there a, a, a Southern Illinois? Is it, um, that's that's the kind of school where we're going to see pretty significant hits. Uh, it's a regional in a state where we've already had a population decline and even more so post COVID. Those are the those are the schools that are going to be the most vulnerable. And if you pick a small private without a big endowment in New York, New Jersey, Massachusetts, Rhode Island, um, anywhere in that northern Midwest, those are those privates that are going to be hit the most. While IU, uh, University of Illinois, students are still going to go there because it's still that flagship experience in that state. Um, so that's a that's where our strength is going to persist. So now, now that we've talked about uh, talked about what's happening in higher ed, what I love to talk about is what's so great about the fraternal experience. Why does this matter? Whether you are at a, uh, a, a regional public where you're like, oh no, I'm at a regional public and it might be in trouble. Um, frankly, you're in the very best position because they need Greek life more than they ever have before because Greek life is a retention tool. It is a great retention tool. We're going to talk about why. And it's also a great opportunity for us to say to the flagships and the elites, hey, we know we're doing good work. And uh, and so I want to talk about that good work uh, that these that that that's happening within Greek life. But more importantly, that you all are doing within Greek life because there's great, great stuff happening. There's a lot I could talk about, but I'm going to try to summarize it into a couple of different areas. One of the other things to know is that the majority of higher ed research has not been about uh, fraternity and sorority life, right? So we're only we've only been dealing with about two to three percent of all of the research about higher ed, and most that has focused on fraternity and sorority life has focused on alcohol and hazing. Um, that's all important stuff, right? That helps inform how we can best deal with alcohol issues or hazing issues, but we haven't been focusing as much on the really good news. Um, and I've had the, the really great pleasure of being involved in a research project for the past three years that is looking specifically at good news research and making sure that we are finding researchers to look at the good news. We're not doing so to try to manipulate anything. We're doing so to make sure that we've got a better picture of what is working uh, rather than only focusing on where those problem areas are. And what's really been interesting about these, this three years of work is that it has been very easy 
to find what's working well. So congrats to you all, because you all are the ones who are right there on the ground. Um, what we're really looking at is trying to balance this equation, looking at academic, personal, and social development of what's happening within fraternities and sororities. Um, not gonna read this, but I just really like this, uh, this statement because I think it gives a good mission statement of what's happening in fraternity and sorority life on college campuses. So what do we know? Here's from 2011. Uh, these two researchers looked at 17 institutions and 45,000 students and found that fraternity and sorority members had more credit hours, higher GPAs, rejecting the notion that fraternity and sorority affiliated first year students have lower GPAs than non-affiliated. That was in 2011. I'm gonna fast forward this to some things happening now, but there are these couple of studies that were out there. And the really nice thing is we're finding that these things are holding true over time, which is even better for research. If you're a researcher at all, you know that that's called validity and that's a huge thing. Okay. Uh, uh, Hayek in 2002 suggested that fraternity and sorority affiliated students had higher communication and critical thinking abilities. Hassel in 2009 found that, it that uh, uh, fraternity and sorority members had increased community engagement and community service. Alcohol and other drugs, I am going to talk about that. One of the things that we know over time is that fraternity and sorority members consume more alcohol. That is absolutely true which is why it behooves all of us to make sure that we're educating students as well as we can about use. Um, and so I don't want to, uh, I don't want to, to, to paint a Pollyanna picture about what's happening. We know we're attracting really social students and that they like to drink alcohol. Um, however, and this is just something funny that I found, uh, there, was a student, there was a study that looked at if you were to reward students, uh, fraternal students, for not drinking, um, would that work? And yes, indeed, drinking, uh, drinking dropped with, cat, with, uh, with cash prizes, uh, which also suggests, uh, if, if true, uh, that uh, we're not dealing as much with, uh, with students with uh, severe alcohol problems, but really alcohol problems of choice. Um, so I just thought it was kind of a funny study. Okay, let's look at Gallup. And uh, I love, love, love what's coming out of Gallup. We're gonna look at 2014, and we're also gonna look at the most recent research out of 2021. When I was, uh, when I was with the uh, House Directors Institute in, uh, in June, I couldn't talk about the 2020, 2021 results because they weren't out yet. They are now out, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about that. So for, out of 2014, Gallup was studying purpose, social, financial, community, and physical engagement of graduates who uh, they were looking at graduates as a whole and then they noticed that fraternal students uh, fraternal students were outperforming or no, graduates excuse me I might slip into saying students but what I mean on Gallup is always going to be alumni uh, that uh, that fraternally connected alumni were consistently outperforming those who were non-affiliated as undergraduates so, uh, and it didn't matter, and this is a really important point, because you'll often hear that, um, that it's about type of institution, and that wasn't found at all. Whether public, private, small, large, selective, not selective, it didn't matter. Students who were in involved in Greek life were still having amazing experiences when they were undergraduates. Uh, they were more, fraternity and sorority graduates were more likely to thrive in every single element that was studied by Gallup, purpose, social, financial, community, and physical. We'll talk a little bit about what those mean. So when purpose, it was what they do every day. Uh, when they say, essentially, everything, what you do every day, how are, you know, how, how do you feel about how you are with life, fraternity and sorority members, felt better about their that overall purpose. Thriving in the social area, um, more than half of fraternity and sorority graduates said they had strong relationships with friends and family, leading them to be thriving, again, outperforming uh, non-affiliated. Financial, again, outperforming in terms of community service and community engagement, significantly more involved in their communities, um, and physically um, out again outperforming uh, although this was a, this was in the lowest area um, of all of those this was a closer margin than the others 
Uh, in terms of their academic experience, these graduates uh, were more likely to say that they had a professor who cared about them, made them excited about learning when they were in school. One professor who, in, uh, who got them excited and served as a mentor, um, and they uh, agreed that they, uh, that they were more likely to have participated in things like uh, internships, study abroad, extracurricular activities. Uh, alumni, uh, when talking about uh, their institution, were more likely to say that it was the perfect school for them and that they can't imagine a world without this school. This is really important um, for colleges and universities because this is what's called being a net promoter. And so what we saw for fraternity and sorority graduates is they were more likely to recommend their school to other students. Now, when we think about that declining population, and that our fraternity and sorority graduates are these net promoters, that's a really important point. Uh, they're more emotionally attached to their alma mater. Uh, they're more likely to have started a business than non-affiliated students. Uh, and they believe that their institution better prepared them for life after colleges. And this is also a really important point because you'll often hear, well, that's because people who join fraternities and sororities uh, come from, uh, um, you know, uh, wealthier families and all of those things. And I have argued to line blue in the face that if anything, fraternities and sororities are the great leveler. Um, they, it is that what Gallup found uh, uh, was that it didn't matter. Where, whether uh, your race, your ethnicity, socioeconomic status, first generation, college student, none of those things mattered. Uh, they controlled for all of those factors. And these things were still all true about, uh, about fraternity and sorority graduates. Um, so I think that's it. Anytime, uh, anytime you hear, well, that's just because of their background. This is where you have to say, nah, -uh, Gallup studied that. Okay, let's keep looking. Now we're going to look a little bit at 2021. There's a lot more in the 2021 data, but these are just a couple of things that I wanted to share with you. And what you're going to see is that same data that was true in 2014 remains in 2021, that they were more likely to have someone in that college experience that made them excited about learning. Uh, they were uh, more likely to be extremely active in extracurricular activities, to have participated in things like internships, uh, they uh, they continue to be the net promoters um, with uh, the vast majority. I think this was like an 83% or something of, of affiliated alumni as net promoters with under half of non-affiliated alumni doing the same thing. So a pretty significant difference. And, and this is the one where I think we uh, in Greek life fall too quickly to this. We say, well, our alumni donate more. Um, yes. That remains true. And all of these other things are true too. So important. Um, and you can see just 10% of the non-affiliated. So it's again, a pretty significant difference. And then here are those, uh, those, same, uh, those same things in that er those areas of well-being. You can see the percentages for affiliated alumni continuing to outperform versus those non-affiliated alumni. And and this is again, direct credit to the work you're doing, 84% of affiliated alumni saying if they had to do it all over again, they'd absolutely join the fraternal organization. A pretty, pretty resounding, uh, resounding positive. Now we're gonna look at Pike 2020. Gary Pike out of Indiana University, a uh, long time higher ed faculty member um, and long time researcher. And if you, if you at all heard about what were called the Missouri studies in the early 2000s, he had some really great findings. And then they just kind of dropped off. Nobody talked about them anymore. This is one of the researchers that this research group that I've been working with um, said, let's, let's talk to Gary Pike. And I'll be darned if he didn't find some of the very same things that he saw in the early 2000s again true when he was running those numbers in 2020. So this is the name of uh, the article, again, pre-publication. If you've ever gone through a peer review process, you can write it, but then it can take up to 18 months to get it published even harder during a pandemic. So, um, but you can find this and you can find this on the NIC website uh, if you're interested and I can give you a direct, you can search for it or you can uh, get a, you can get a direct, I can get you a direct link. But what he found is that uh, fraternity and sorority members were significantly more engaged in the in-class and out-of-class experience than non-members. Non 
they reported greater learning gains than non-members, and they were more satisfied with their overall college experience. You're hearing a theme, right? You saw that in Gallup and again in, with, uh, with Pike's work. So I am not going to read this, but if you want to scan this, um, it'll give you an idea of how many students were in this sample size. Massive, massive. He was using something called the National Survey on Student Engagement, and he looked at two different administrations of this to uh, to run these numbers. Um, and you can see I've got in bold bold print almost toward the bottom that separate analyses were conducted for first year senior and senior students. Uh, so great, great findings after some really rigorous research. Uh, so greater learning gains, more satisfied improved learning gains and and i love this this was a finding that he didn't expect we didn't expect it but it was pretty darn awesome to see although less diverse students who are involved in fraternities and sororities report higher levels of interaction with people who are different from themselves than did non-affiliated students. So another critique often of the Greek experience is that that's that, well, it's not diverse, but looking at that Nessie data, really, really great finding in this area. Now, he did find in his work that, uh, that there were lower grades than non-members, but it wasn't significant. And if you've studied, um, if you, if you studied st stats at all, um, it, unless a number comes off as significant, it's not really a finding. Uh, so he couldn't find that it absolutely was true, but, it, um, but his overall run of numbers didn't back up that DeBaird and Sachs study that I shared with you from 2011. Oh, thank you, Scott. There's that link. If you want to look at look at everything about that. Thanks for putting that up there, Scott. Mm -hmm. So let's see. Um, this is coming. These are his words. These are Gary Pike's words. So I want you to look at this. That the findings of this study indicate that fraternities and sororities are not antithetical to the values of American higher ed, as some have suggested. To the contrary, membership is associated with, and I've talked about this, greater involvement more student, uh, uh, a promotion of student learning and promoting the satisfaction with the college experience. And he goes on to write, furthermore, the largest positive effects were generally found for first year students arguing against the concept of deferring recruitment until the second semester or second year. I have argued for years, and I'm sure many of you all have as well, that you know when schools say, well, we're deferring, you know, we're going to a deferred recruitment model, and you say, well, why? Um, you know, what, you know, uh, what, what suggests that that's the thing to do? They said, well, um, you know, we know a lot of other schools are doing this. We just think it's the right thing to do. The data doesn't back it up, and I think this is a really important thing for us to know and understand. Okay, let's look at mental health because it's another important study. Um, large scale data set coming out of the University of Michigan. And when I say the University of Michigan, it's uh, University of Michigan does what's called the healthy mind study, but it is looking at colleges and universities across this country. So it's coming out of this, uh, out of a research center at the University of Michigan, but it's a national data set of 78 colleges and universities over 41,000 respondents. Uh, the researchers are out of the University of Tennessee's um, uh, post-secondary education research center, Patrick Biddix, uh, with two of the research associates, Asalone and Grace. Fraternity and sorority members reported higher mental health scores, lower scores related to depression and anxiety, lower lifetime diagnoses of depression, higher lifetime interesting di diagnoses of anxiety. So there's our, our ding, ding, ding. Higher lifetime use of therapy. Now what this means, higher lifetime diagnosis of anxiety, higher lifetime use of therapy, what that means, how do they know that if they're studying current students? What that means is that that may have happened in middle school, high school, and they used and they already were engaged in therapy prior to enrolling in college. So that's what those two mean. However, lower rates of current, uh, lower rates of current use of therapy and higher positive ratings of campus support systems. And so what we're seeing in those fraternity and sorority members is um, uh, more usage at, at a younger age and then coming to college with better adjustment than non-affiliated students. Um, 
Interestingly, though, they're also lower knowledge of where to go to access mental health services. And so if you're hearing this within your uh, within your buildings, make sure that you're uh, that you're uh, that you are um, letting your students know where that's available. And apparently they're amenable to it. So that's a good thing. On what's called the flourishing scale, um, the, on, on self-perceived uh, success, re, uh, on relationships, self-esteem, purpose, and optimism, that's where we're seeing much, much higher scores in all of those aspects of well-being. And want to make sure you see this benefit. Uh, we're going to soon release reports on the benefits of the single sex experience, as well as sorority and body image. And I, I actually have had the pleasure of helping uh, write this piece on sorority and body image uh, because out of it was actually out of some data that Gary Pike generated. Um, and uh, it, although he hadn't written something separately, we asked him if he's going to write that up. And he said, no, but if you want to write it up, you can. So I've been working this summer uh, actually with a sorority woman who's been serving as my uh, my research assistant. And we are writing up data. If you had told me that sorority women have better body image than non-affiliated students, I would have said, really? The data says they do. And we're going to have that article out soon as well. So those are the things that I wanted to tell you about because, again, the forest for the trees, fraternities and sororities do great things, and you all are doing great things. So please, please, please don't forget that. Do everything you can to advocate for the fraternal experience. If you need a cheerleader in your ear, I'm ready to be that person because I love what's happening on these campuses, and I thank you for that. Um, I think that those are here. Here are these key takeaways. I'm not going to. Uh, I'm not going to repeat those. Um, I will say. Now is not the time to close chapters. Um, I, I say this all the time, but I mean it, uh, that as you're thinking about, uh, as, you're, as your co uh, college, as your campuses look at different issues um, with a declining student population, you're gonna wanna keep your foothold on these campuses. And if you do close chapters, make sure that your organizations are, our organizations are insisting on return agreements to those campuses. And I always say this, college students, like all people, are sometimes subject to poor decision making, but fraternity and sorority members as a subset of these students overwhelmingly are doing great things on campuses. Um, it doesn't mean that we're not concerned about things like sexual misconduct, alcohol, hazing, et cetera, but the overall picture is very, very good for fraternities and sororities. Um, so, let me see, gosh, I still have more. I'm looking at, oh, here we go. Happier, healthier, more involved, all lovely, lovely things. And this is how you can contact me if you need a cheerleader on that day when you're feeling like uh, like they're, uh, like it's uh, really, really tough. I'm ready to tell you, A, awesome work that's happening that you all are doing, and B, let's keep supporting these students. So thanks so much. I don't know if there are any questions, but I'd love it if there are. Love it. I, while um, we're given a couple seconds for those questions to pop in, I thank you first off for sharing with our group tonight. Uh, I, just incredible information. The and it, uh, for any of us who are database uh, data driven uh, folks, I just I just love it because you can't argue with the numbers, right? You can't argue with facts, and um, most most of the time anyway. Uh, but a lot of what you shared and a question that Charles wrote earlier got me thinking about some of the um, uh, questions that Mike McCree brought up when we were together and uh, when we were together in Colorado and thinking about and Charles's question was really about COVID. But, you know, what are some of the other trends that we can expect out of students this fall? And some of the things that Mike brought to light when we were uh, together in Denver, he talked about, you know, we can expect two and a half years of freshmen to be showing up at our chapters this year. And what did he mean by that? Well, this year's seniors are the only class that have had an uninterrupted year of college. So we've got two and a half years, close to three, of students who've not had an uninterrupted year of school. So we thought it was difficult to be an advisor <laughs> previously. We're about to really earn the big bucks, right? Because you've got a bunch of young men and women who are coming back into our chapter houses that really don't know how to do recruitment. That really don't know how to do risk management. That really don't, that may not know how to register a social event 
have no idea how to uh, execute a new member education program. So we are really going to, if there was ever a year where we can expect to be needed and um, expect to really put our coaching hat on, this is the year because again, we've got two and a half, three years of students who've never had to be in a, had never had to execute a leadership role. They've been in leadership roles, but now they're actually having to do the work and they don't really know how because they've not done it before. So expect two and a half, three years of freshmen to be in your chapter houses and in your chapters uh, and expect them to have a lot of questions because they just don't know yet. They just don't know. So the other thing that Mike uh, shared to expect is they're really going to want, want, and Don, this isn't going to come as a surprise, I don't think, but they're really going to want to make up for lost time uh, because of the last two, the last 18 months have been really difficult and who knows what it's going to look like when we get back. So um, the other thing I would expect, uh, or I, I would say you could probably expect is it's not a matter of if, but when we have outbreaks, I talked to a, uh, a housing professional today and she shared with me that, look, houses haven't even officially opened yet. And I've got two or three properties that already have an outbreak. Um, and these are on campuses that are requiring vaccinations. So I don't understand it, but some schools aren't even, a, you know, they're saying you gotta be vaccinated, but you've got until September to do it. So you're already on campus. If you're not vaccinated, you're, you're potentially bringing your COVID uh, infection to campus. So, so it's weird. Uh, so expect the unexpected again at, at this fall. So uh, that, those are just a few of the things as as uh, as Don was talking. Then I was thinking about Charles's question. Some of the mics, some of the things that Mike shared with us this summer. Uh, some of the things I was uh, thinking about him. He actually uh, worked with me last week or the week before, and we recorded his session uh, in a kind of a house and home on demand. I'll put the link to that uh, video in the chat. So if you want to copy and paste that, that's there for you to check it out. It gives us 10 or 11 uh, trends and things to expect, and ways to be prepared for students to come back this fall. So I highly encourage you to, to check that link out. And then um, as far as the COVID protocols that Charles was talking about, I believe, uh, and, and I'm gonna lean on Debbie Friedman a little bit on this one too, but would highly encourage you, Charles, and everybody else on the call, uh, COVID seems to be very, very local. Uh, and what's the experience that Don's having in Virginia may be completely different than the one I'm having in Indianapolis. So really check out what your local CDC guidelines and recommendations are. I know here in Indianapolis, they're recommending if you're inside, you should be masked, whether you're vaccinated or not. Uh, so would really encourage you to look to see what your local CDC recommendations are or what the CDC is recommending for you locally. The other thing I would recommend you do or highly encourage you to do is to check in with your, your national organization, your international headquarters. So I know I've seen several organizations over the last week and a half, two weeks, start to bring out their COVID protocol uh, policies and procedures, making sure that all the vendors and partners that support those facilities understand what the expectations are when we are in your homes. So your national, international organization already may have a thought on what your protocol should be. So what I highly encourage you to reach out to your contact at uh, headquarters or your executive office uh, for guidance there, because it's every organization's potentially gonna be handling this a little bit differently. And I don't wanna give you information that could be in conflict with uh, what they might offer. So the other thing I would encourage you to do is just encourage your students to get vaccinated. That is the best way we know right now how to spread this, uh, spread how to decrease the spread of, of um, of this virus. So that's those are the things that I would offer up in, in terms of things to think about in terms of protocols. But uh, Debbie, can I lean on you really quickly? What are you hearing? I know you you work uh, with a lot of folks in the community. What are you, what is a EFI doing? What are you hearing in the community and in, in terms of uh, protocols and what kind of additional insight could you offer up to this conversation? Debbie, you still with us? There she is. And we can't hear you, Debbie, but I see you're unmuted. I 
at you, Debbie. We're going to come back to you. Cindy, are you with us? I am. What, um, I hate to put you on the spot, but obviously given the, the amount of exposure and the number of people that you get to work with, is there any insight you could maybe offer the, the conversation in terms of what to expect and what you're seeing in terms of what the recommendations are in terms of COVID protocols uh, within the, especially on the shorty side? Well, it was interesting because we had developed a, a document last fall about returning to your chapter and we uh, dusted it off and looked at how we needed to modify it for this year and we really haven't changed it um, uh, because I think that we're going to be looking at a lot of the same standards and um, I'm seeing now I think there's a total uh, and again I just ensure women's sorority so I, I don't have any sense of what the men's groups are going through but I know that we're seeing now upwards of nine sororities that are requiring masks um, if you are in communal living. So I think we'll see probably more of that. And I am seeing an increase in the number of universities. I think it's up to like 682 now um, that are requiring vaccination. So I, I'm not sure we're going to see this fall too unlike what we did last year. I do agree with Scott, however, that we're going to see a, a lot of pent up excitement about uh, event planning. And I think that that's something that's going to be an, a new conundrum that we're going to have to deal with that we really didn't, we weren't faced with in the fall or um, the spring of this last year. Yeah. yeah. So uh, one other thing I just threw in the chat is uh, um, Cindy just mentioned their COVID uh, response resources on the MJ website. Uh, so I just put that in the chat. So uh, a ton of information there for you to consider as you're trying to think through how to best prepare for the rest of this fall in terms of uh, uh, COVID response. So um, I'm not seeing any other questions in the chat. So um, give everybody about five more seconds to ask a question if you have one. So otherwise we will just start to wrap it up here. So I'm not seeing anything. So um let's see here so hey with all that being said uh again thank you to dawn uh for such an incredible session tonight thanks to each of you for showing up and and showing out and for the amount of uh care and commitment you're providing this community we are so grateful uh, especially right now as we go in through into a really challenging um a challenging fall it seems like we said the exact same thing last fall but uh seems like we're you know, sort of right back at it so uh if you have any questions along the way if we can come alongside you in any way shape or form or we can help you get connected with uh, a conversation or a relationship or a resource our contact information is on the screen please feel free to reach out here help in any way we can uh that's my cell number if you uh, need me you can call or text i'll be happy to uh, to get back to you at my first opportunity if I'm unavailable. So with all, all that being said, uh, thank you again for joining us tonight. Thank you again to Dawn for, for, uh, for sharing and uh, we will see you guys next time on House and Home. Take care, everyone.